and I invite you to continue as together we pray the opening prayer you find printed in the bulletin. Great triune God, we have gathered here in your name as an act of faith, believing that you are not only among us, but that you love us. It is often hard to recognize your love, see your mercy, and feel your presence. Help us today in our worship that we might be transparent to your grace as you reveal yourself to each one of us. Amen. You have the appointed scripture passages for the day in the bulletin. I invite you, if you choose, to uh, follow along as I read. You also may choose to listen. The Old Testament lesson is taken from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. Um, Jeremiah is writing to a people who are living in a time of political and religious convulsions, if you will, and he's comforting the people of the northern and the southern kingdoms and saying that in spite of their past infidelity, that he's speaking, remember, to a divided kingdom, he's saying that God will act in a new way. So Jeremiah writes, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant with me even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. No, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will no longer need to teach each other to say, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. Herein ends the reading of the Old Testament lesson. Our Psalter lesson comes from Psalm 51. We will read it responsibly. It is attributed to David, um, and it is a prayer of confession, if you will. So we will not do the statement of confession in the bulletin because we're going to use this as our prayer of confession. And when we finish it, I'll read what's printed in the bulletin, the words of forgiveness, uh, if we had used the other prayer. This prayer scholars attribute to David praying after his uh, affair with Bathsheba had been revealed by uh, his advisor, and it is his lament and prayer of statement of his personal sin. So let us read this as our statement of our sin. Have mercy on me, God, according to your faithful love. Wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Because I know my wrongdoings, my sin is always right in front of me. I have sinned against you, you alone. I have committed evil in your sight. That's why you are justified when you bring your guilt upon me. Completely correct when you issue your judgment. Yes, I was born in guilt, in sin, from the moment my mother conceived me. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let them hear joy and celebration again. Let the bones you crush rejoice once more. Hide your face from my sins. Wipe away all my guilty deeds. Create a clean heart for me, O God. Put a new faithful spirit deep inside me. And 
Please don't throw me out of your presence. Please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. And hear these words of assurance. The Lord has indeed done great things for us, as our righteousness is one that comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God based on faith. The good news, therefore, is this. In Jesus Christ, we are accepted, we are loved, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And our epistle lesson continues as we read from the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. Um, this is a, he, the book of Hebrews, as some of you know, is perhaps the greatest theological treatise in the New Testament. It's also written in uh, what scholars tell us is the best Greek. And we read today, um, the book of Hebrews does a lot to talk about the sacrificial tradition of the Hebrew people and why sacrifice was necessary for the forgiveness of sins and how Jesus becomes the great high priest, and that no longer will there need to be, or no longer was there a need, for the system of sacrifice. We have this strange character who shows up. I'm not preaching from this passage because it's just theologically uh, packed, but we have this strange creature or person that shows up in it, Melchizedek, who also appeared to... Abraham and Sarah, so it's, uh, he's, we know he represents the priestly class, and the writer of Hebrews is referring back to that and saying that Jesus is still the supreme high priest for us. So let us listen to this lesson. In the same way, Christ also didn't promote himself to become high priest. Instead, it was the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now during his days on earth, Christ offered prayers and requests with loud cries and tears as his sacrifices to the one who was able to save him from death. He was heard because of his godly devotion. And although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And after he had been made perfect, he became the source of salvation for everyone who obeys him. He was appointed by God to be a high priest according to to the order of Melchizedek. Herein ends the reading of the epistle lesson. Will you please stand for the reading of the gospel? So we're reading the gospel of John. It is the festival of the Passover. And um, we have this story that I'll talk a little bit more about in the sermon. Some Greeks were among those who had come up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and made a request. Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip told Andrew. Andrew told Philip, who told Jesus. Jesus replied, The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I assure you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it cannot be, it can only be a single seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their lives will lose them, and those who hate their lives in this world will keep them forever. Whoever serves me must follow me. Wherever I am, there my servant will also be. My Father will honor whoever serves me. 
Now I am deeply troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this time? No, for this is the reason I have come to this time. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Now the crowd standing there heard and said, It's thunder. Others said, An angel spoke to him. Jesus replied, The voice wasn't for my benefit, but for yours. Now is the time for judgment of this world. Now this world's ruler will be thrown out. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. He said this to show how he was going to die. This is the word of God for the people of Christ. Thanks be to God. Remain standing as we sing our hymn of preparation, hymn number 369. Join me as I pray. Oh God, we give thanks to you for joining together as this family who follows Jesus. And we acknowledge that we also gather with other brothers and sisters all across the globe as we worship Jesus our great high priest. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. It's really kind of a week off, but we've kind of lived with it now for a week, so I think it's okay to talk about this. I'm not sure that all of you have fully recovered 
from daylight savings time. <laughs> In fact, if I say wake up during the sermon, it's because I've caught one of you nodding. And I'm going to just tell you, wake up. The time has moved forward and it's time not to sleep. Sunday afternoon is a time for naps. Except I know a lot of you are going to be watching basketball later today. Oh, come on, be honest. You've already told me about the shock that some of you have about Virginia. And John Shoemaker, you didn't tell me how excited you are about Alabama and where you are. <laughs> Nobody ever expects Alabama to be playing Clemson in the NCAA tournament for basketball, right? right. All right, so you're awake with me. So... I think today is an appropriate time to talk about time. And I've discussed this before about how the Bible views time. But I think it bears repeating. There are at least two different kinds. One is chronos and it refers to linear time, the kind of time that is represented on this wristwatch of mine that you all know I live by, right? Yes. But try as I might, even during worship, sometimes I will get a text because I am on call for the hospital all the time and I can't help myself. I look at it because I'm living on linear time. And by the way, my calendar's on here too. It pops up. Ten minutes before any meeting, just as it did outside to remind me it's time for worship at Lake Topsaway United Methodist Church. Some of you in your pockets or in your purse have a little personal calendar because you don't want it electronic yet. You still prefer that paper. My wife prefers paper. And so in your purse, you've got a little personal calendar that tends, if we're honest, to enslave us sometimes, right? That calendar makes us dance to its rhythm and march to its cadence. Come on, you're like me, and we live by the watch and the calendar. Uh oh, I just changed the face of my watch. I don't want to do that. Some of you have a smart watch, know how that fun it is to get to change that. We live by our watches. And our schedules. I can tell you by pulling out my phone and pulling up my calendar what I have to do this coming week, what meetings I better attend. You know the difference between a meeting you better attend and one that you can pretend you forgot? I can tell you what commitments I've made to officiate at weddings. I better show up at those, right? I can tell you when I receive an invitation because a little invitation pops up and says, will you accept this meeting? Do you know about that? Mm -hmm. On Outlook. and you, It's so nice. You just hit, sure, I'll accept that invitation. And then it's on my calendar. I suspect that all of you understand what I mean when I say we have just too much to do sometimes on our calendars. And you know, sometimes it's a little annoying because not only do we now live by our calendars, but our cell phones, I can reach you just about anywhere you are, even right after a surgery. I can wake you up and say, sorry, I know you're in that great anesthesia sleep, but I'm bothering you to tell you as your pastor I care about you. I've done that with a few of you, haven't I? <laughs> that is chronos time. 
linear time. The kind of time that for most of us seems to just fly by. Doesn't it? Used to seem to fly by like in the weeks, but the older I get, it's like months fly by, quarters. In fact, I would almost even say years fly by. What happened that I am now going to be 57 years of age? You're old like the rest of us. I am. And you know what? That chronos time is inevitable, and you and I can't stop it. The best example I have is to say to you that when a woman's time comes to have a baby, nothing is going to prevent it from occurring. I have a niece that has three children. I remember when her little boy Seth was due. I called her and said, Alicia, when's the baby coming? Aren't you at 40 weeks? If anyone else asks me that question, they risk not surviving. Well, Seth, unlike his other two siblings who were born early, decided, and this was before the day doctors made a decision that a woman wouldn't carry a baby beyond 41 weeks, which is the present uh, decision. Seth was stubborn and decided that he wanted to delay coming into the world. So her 41st week rolled around. No baby. Her 42nd week rolled around. And I remember calling Alicia again and saying, Alicia, they have ways to help you have that baby. If you say one more word to me, Uncle Marcus, I'm coming and you will personally go to your grave today. Needless to say, when Seth was born, 42 weeks and one day, my niece and all of us who loved her were relieved. My niece still swears she carried Seth for 11 months. <laughs> Kairos is the other kind of time that cannot be pinpointed specifically on the calendar, either as a future event or as a present event. And it really cannot be determined by mere mortals like you and me. It depends on all the circumstances surrounding it to come in line in such a way that whatever event is going to happen happens in a divine, unending, eternal kind of way. It happens on its own momentum. It happens not according to anyone's prediction. It's the kind of time that was referred to in the account we read from in John's gospel where Jesus says to his disciples the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. On a number of occasions prior to this statement Jesus has said to his followers my time has not yet come. Remember when he went to the wedding at Cana in the Gospel of John? You remember that, because remember, that's a great story. It's why we Methodists say we can have alcohol. 
<laughs> and Mary, his mother, came to him and said, the wine's run out, do something. And Jesus said to his mother, my time has not yet come. And later in John's account of the ministry of Jesus, Jesus is attending the festival of, uh, festival of booths in Jerusalem. He is making his presence known and he is creating problems for the religious leaders. So they try to have him arrested. However, John's gospel tells us they're not successful. Why? Because, John tells us, his time has not yet come. Happens again in the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John where Jesus encounters the woman caught in adultery. Where Jesus makes that great statement. Anyone without the first sin, he actually says he because it was men who were accusing her. He without the first sin, or he without sin, excuse me, what was that passage? He without sin, what were they to do? You know it. They wanted then to arrest him. The religious leaders, that is. But his time had not yet come. So John in the gospel is not referring to time X time or to linear calendar time. He's talking about kairos time. That moment when circumstances collide and whatever is going to happen, happens. It's a climatic moment when Jesus' time will come. I often say to people who are grieving related to this concept of Kairos time who are struggling to say, but how can my mother be okay getting to heaven knowing that I'm still here? And I remind them that we can't wrap our minds around Cairo's time. But then in eternity, it is one unending day. You've heard me say this before, right? Mm -hmm. And so the day that I arrive in heaven is the same day my mother arrives. Because it's not measured in minutes, hours, in eternity. How can you even imagine measuring time like that? It's one and ending day. And so here is Kairos time where Jesus says, my time is now. It is during that last week of the life of Jesus on the earth. Well, at least his last life, his last week of life on the earth as fully human, fully God before the resurrection. And the disciples and Jesus are in Jerusalem for the Passover. The high, significant religious event for Jews. Some Greeks, Greeks approached Philip. Why did they approach Philip? Do you know, here John helps us understand because he says, Philip is from Bethsaida in Galilee which, by the way, was very near a city called Decapolis, which was heavily populated by Greeks. Makes sense now, doesn't it? Any of you know where Tarpon Springs is in Florida? Any of you live close to it? Yeah. So you can't live in Tarpon Springs or anywhere close to it without not knowing something about the Greek culture, right? right? And so in the same way, I think because Philip 
was acquainted with Greeks and their way of life, the Greeks came to him. But then Philip goes to Andrew. Why Andrew? Well, in John's Gospel, Andrew is always the one. Every time Andrew is mentioned in the Gospel of John, he's the one who introduces someone to Jesus. So evidently, Andrew's very good at it. And together they bring the Greeks to Jesus and he begins to talk with them about the inevitability, about what is going to happen in Jerusalem. And then it seems a bit strange because the Greeks are just dropped all together from the story. They're not heard about again. But it's at this point Jesus finally says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Why now? What's the deal with the Greeks since they've been, been introduced and they're forgotten? What is John's point? Well, the answer is found in the verse that just precedes this story. Jesus has made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And never at any point in his ministry is he more popular on that day, which we will celebrate next Sunday, Palm Sunday. So popular, in fact, that the Pharisees say, look, the whole world has gone after him to follow him. The whole world. And just to prove the point, John wants us to remember here are some Greeks as representation of the whole world who have an audience with Jesus. And that's exactly the way God intended it to be. The point is clear. John, in writing the gospel, frames the story. The gospel is embodied in the Nazarene who is not just for the Jews, but for the whole world, as we read last week in the Gospel of John, the third chapter, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The whole world. And now Jesus says, the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The same, by the way, was true for the prophet Jeremiah. He found himself standing at the crossroad of his life and ministry. One road is marked by chronos time. The other is marked by kairos time. Let's talk about chronos first. Israel is in trouble. It's the year 587 B.C. And the operative word here is exile. Remember what happens in 586 B.C.? Come on, some of you know. What happened in 586 B.C.? The temple got destroyed. And they were exiled. The Jews were to, thank you, Bill. Where? And we believe, scholars tell us, that most of the book of Psalms got written down at that time because... How can we sing a song in a foreign land? The Jews were in deep despair because they were the people who had been brought out of Egypt in bondage into the promised land. They had seen the building of Jerusalem 
And finally, the construction of the temple where God was represented to dwell only because they had made all kinds of arrangements with foreign countries rather than serving God only to experience the destruction of their temple and they were exiled into Babylon. And it was in the midst of that kind of calendar chronos time where God says the days are surely coming by the way, literally translated from the Hebrew, that means the whisper of Yahweh to Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, God whispers, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And this is the covenant that I will make with them. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. people. And no longer will they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall know me from the least to the greatest, whispers the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. <clears throat> you see, God whispers into the ear of the prophet Jeremiah and his words form a love letter for the people of God. And it suddenly becomes Kairos time. By the way, this letter in the Old Testament is perhaps the closest thing to the New Testament you will find. I find that scripture so incredibly profound. I will put my law within them. Who is that within them? Jesus the Christ and I will write it on their hearts not on tablets so back to, to the gospel of John where Jesus says the time has come for the son of man to be glorified they shall know me from the least to the greatest And I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more, Jeremiah says. What Jeremiah and Jesus gave us were comforting words to a dispirited, unfaithful group. In Jeremiah's time, the people were living in shambles. And the disciples, too, were worried about their future. How were they going to survive without Jesus, their leader? Both times were a time of insecurity and fear and overwhelming odds against them. People were without hope. What rules should they follow? How would they survive? And the new covenant provides a different framework in which we are to live in the world. It's not about rules, which would be chronos time. It's not about liturgy. Yes, I confess, you know I like liturgy. It's not about procedures and policies. It's about forgiveness. Kairos time. Forgiveness allows us 
to live unencumbered by the past, unafraid of the future. Forgiveness allows us to live fully and wholly. And remember, forgiveness can't be purchased or borrowed. It can only be received. And how do we receive it? By confession of our sin. By receiving Christ as Lord. And by deciding that we will live Give in the grace that brings us eternal life. Unfortunately, we do live in Chronos time. And so, for some of us, me included, by the way, forgiveness. is sometimes a temporary condition, even though it's designed to be a permanent change. It will be a permanent change. And that is what Kairos time is about. But in the meantime, God forgives, God forgets. And God wants us to forgive and forget. Marcus, the original grudge holder, needs to hear that statement again. I'm going to say it one more time. God wants us to forget, and God wants us to forgive with a tremendous heart that is not our heart, but it is the heart of God. I must confess, I can hold some grudges. You can too. But God can empower us to experience the power of Kairos time. The forgiveness and grace and mercy and love of Christ in such a way that our hearts are opened big. And we can forget and forgive. And all is forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. I invite you to continue in worship as we take our hymnals, turn in the back to 881, or if you have it committed to memory, this is the Apostles' Creed. Will you stand as together we confess what we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
seated. And we continue in worship as we come to that time where we offer our prayer concerns, believing that God hears and that God responds. There are numerous things for which we give thanks to God for prayers that have been answered. We continue to pray for those who grieve the death of loved ones, but those who grieve in hope, knowing that um, their loved ones have gone into eternity. We continue to hold uh, the friend that some of many of you have from Burlingame, Andy, uh, as she deals with an illness that is terminal. We celebrate faces that are among us who are examples of um, recovery and answers to prayer. Um, as we continue to hold some people in prayer who, like Connie Costigan, amaze and surprise us. What other prayer concerns do you have and do you want to bring to us at this time? Do you want to stand up, Bill? People won't be able to hear you. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm having glad I can't the bar to lose it too. So if you didn't hear, Bill is having surgery tomorrow to remove uh, a tumor in his bladder. And so he and Sherry appreciate your prayers. Um, <laughs> Sherry Minnick, I called you in recovery, if you remember it. I called your husband in recovery who said, oh, come on, talk to Sherry. <laughs> So it wasn't that I wanted to speak to you, it was he wanted me to pray with you. <laughs> and we are praying for um, things to happen well. Yes, I am praying for forgiveness, uh, that Sherry will forgive me. But I'm praying more importantly, Bill, for you and for Sherry uh, as you undergo this. Other prayer concerns? Judy Wells, we lost her husband a week ago. Thank you for reminding a friend that many of you have um, who lived here at Topsway so many years and they were back here. So her husband died very suddenly and unexpectedly. Are there others? As always, the altar is open if you choose to join me as we prepare to pray. <laughs> God, we pray because we have learned and continue to learn, even though you know what our needs are before we ask, we have learned and continue to learn that when we gather as a people of faith and agree in prayer, you hear and respond. We pray specifically today for Bill and ask that you would take the entire team who will be in ministry to him and that their hands will become your healing hands. We pray for Sherry and for grace that is sufficient to second and minutes that can seem like hours. We pray for Andy. We also, oh God, pray for those who grieve. For Judy, 
and for others even in this place who have lost loved ones in recent weeks and months. We give witness, O oh God, to the power of your continued work in the life of Bob, in the life of Connie, and in the lives of so many others. Indeed, God, we are a community that gives witness to the healing work and ministry of Jesus the Christ. And so we trust that you hear both our spoken and unspoken needs. As we continue to pray, as Christ taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. continue together as our ushers come forward to receive our tithes and our offerings. Thank you for raising up faithful messengers and sending your son, Jesus, to draw us close to you. Give us the ability to listen and obey you. Direct our efforts to fulfill your will in our lives and as part of this congregation. May our offerings, gifts, and service bring joy to people here in our neighborhood and around the world. We pray through the word incarnate, Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 397.
Sometimes in worship, I find myself caught in chronos time. And I catch a glimpse of what it's going to be like to be unfettered by my watch and calendar. Now I'm thinking about the fact that we've gone five minutes long. <laughs> I'm back in Kronos time. But in Kairos time, we are caught up in the glory, the grace, the mercy, the love, the forgiveness, the eternity of God. Let us go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.